We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. So I want to make it clear, I don't, I don't see the CIA being directly involved. I'm not making that accusation. What I am saying is the people that they were using as anti-Castro operatives, which is not unusual to use American citizens. So that wasn't in that, that sense of leave, but we do obviously use American citizens to, to do intelligence operations overseas, right? So that, that was not, if you like, illegal. But what was right on the edge was the fact that those same people were not only anti-Castro, guess what? They were hugely anti the Kennedys, hugely. That was the, the area where Helms and Angleton showed incredibly bad judgment in not understanding the nature of these people. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Dr. Anthony Wells, and we discuss his latest book, Crossroads in Time, Philby and Angleton, A Story of Treachery, which takes a look at the relationship between Kim Philby and James Jesus Angleton. And the book also takes a critical look at if Angleton could have done more whilst working at the CIA to prevent the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. On there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for £3 a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Dr. Anthony Wells, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's a great pleasure, Chris. It's nice to be with you. It's great to have you back on. Just for the benefit of listeners, please could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm a 50-year veteran of the uh, Five Eyes intelligence community of the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Started in the business in the late 60s. And uh, my last real project was sort of ended at uh, December 2019. So, you know, I've been around in the intelligence community for 50 years. I was trained by some of the finest people that were around in World War II, and I was greatly honored to have people like Sir Harry Hinsley as my mentor and guide. And, and so I was very fortunate as a young man to be born into that community as a fairly young British Royal Navy officer. And uh, later on, I was sent here to Washington, D.C. and worked for the community and the U.S. Navy, and later on came back permanently in late 1983 to work on a special program and stayed ever since. And I've been working very closely still with the United Kingdom and the other members of the Five Eyes community, as well as the United States intelligence community. Excellent, excellent. So you have a a brilliant new book called Crossroads in Time, which we'll discuss over this episode. Before we go into specifics about the book, can you just talk to us about your interest in the subject of uh, James Jesus Angleton and Kim Philby and how you went about researching this book? 
Yes, the two these two people were very unusual men. Kim Philby, of course, is well known by most people in the United Kingdom as probably the worst spy in British history. And James Jesus Angleton was the head of uh, United States uh, Central Intelligence Agency counterintelligence for an extremely um, long period from 1954, in fact, to 1975. He and Philby struck up a relationship during World War II uh, when Angleton uh, was became a newly fledged member of the Office of Strategic Services under Wild Bill Donovan, and uh, Kim Philby was working for MI6, and they met in London and uh, became close friends and associates and developed a relationship right the way through until after Philby defected from the Middle East, from Beirut in January 1963. So it's a very close, very personal relationship, somewhat unusual in many ways. And so I started to research this several years ago, and the Real origins of it started with a very important association with a former, a very distinguished American journalist, member of the Washington Post, Jefferson Morley. And he had written a book about um, Angleton called The Ghost, and another book about uh, a man called Winston Scott, who we'll talk about later on, called Our Man in Mexico. And he and I struck up a very strong professional relationship. And I um, had done a lot of work on Angleton as well, and also obviously Philby being with my background, knew a lot about Philby, became very, very intimately knowledgeable of Angleton as a result of working with Jefferson Morley. And we had a lot of very, very, very significant information uh, that hadn't been made public. One was a critical affidavit uh, that was signed by Angleton's personal secretary, personal assistant back in 1994, and a lady called Jane Roman. And she gave away information that had been buried for decades to do with uh, Angleton's modus operandi and a lot of the things he got up to, and also, you know, in association um, with a man who, you know, was really a very, very important person in the whole business as well, called Richard Helms, who subsequently became director of the Central Intelligence Agency. But at a critical time in the early 1960s was a deputy director of operations and was really Angleton's boss. And those two did some things which subsequently and were exposed later on as uh, being illegal. And in fact, Helms was given a suspended uh, a jail sentence by U.S. federal district judge and a very heavy, very heavy fine. So there's an extraordinary set of circumstances here that's never been quite uh, divulged. And my book, which is novelistic in 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 form and also factual as well, so it's a combination of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was it was a very very interesting book, and I just finished it just yesterday. And uh, yeah, there's some very interesting bits in there, especially about uh, the uh, Kennedy assassination, which we'll go into in a little bit. So, just for the benefit of listeners, because there may be some people out there who are not so knowledgeable about the Cambridge Five. So, I was wondering if you could just talk just a little bit about who they were. Yeah, the Cambridge Five were 1930s people at Cambridge. You know, there were simply, you know, just to just to name there was. Harold Kim Philby, known as Kim, and then uh, the person that he recruited was a guy called Guy Burgess, and that there was another gentleman called Donald McLean. Well, they were the three hardcore members of the Cambridge Five. Um, Philby uh, recruited Burgess into the KGB because they were Marxist-Leninists in their uh, intellectual philosophy, in terms of their economic views of the world in the 30s, long before they realized just how bad Stalin was and what the true nature of the Soviet Union was all about. But they were idealistic people at Cambridge, Marxists. And um, uh, later on, Burgess, when he joined MI6, then recruited or recommended Philby for recruitment by Stuart Menzies, the head of the British Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6. The other two people were Anthony Blunt, who most people know as the Queen's uh, man who advised on all artwork, and the other one was John Carecross, who wasn't exposed actually until 1990. Um, Anthony Blunt was like 1979. They were lesser mortals in terms of their roles in the KGB process, the amount of information they gave away, et cetera. But the worst three were definitely Philby, Philby Burgess, and McLean. Philby and Burgess were both at Trinity College, Cambridge together. And that is where Philby you know, recruited Burgess into uh, the KGB through his Russian handler. They all had code names. Philby was either Sony or Stanley, and Burgess was Hicks, and McLean was Homer, and so, and Anthony Blunt was Johnson, and John Cairncross was, was Lit. So they all have their KGB code names. So, you know, that's, that's the, those are the Cambridge Five. 
Uh, uh, Bollington and Burgess were members of the Cambridge Apostles Group, you know, Cambridge Secret Society as well. Mm. Can you talk to us a little bit more about sort of Kim Philbin and sort of what motivated him and a little bit more about his recruitment by the Russians? Yeah, he was an idealist. Uh, you know, he was studying economics at Cambridge. He became very much oriented towards the Marxist view of economics and was approached um, by the KGB people who were running him. And in, of course, Ken Cross. Uh, was a very important person because he was very much a, a talent spotter, a recruiter for the KGB. And so I think Philby was spotted as being someone who was um, ideologically prone towards the Soviet Union, also had various other vulnerabilities. Yeah. And um, can you talk to us a little bit about then the other person of your book, James Jesus Angleson, and how he ended up working for the OSS and, and a little bit about his sort of background? Yeah, he came from an international background and spent some time in the UK. We went to Malvern College, where he was a boarder, loved the British. He liked the British culture. He admired the upper class structure of the of the British establishment. So he always had that fascination with the British and after a very distinguished career, he was at Yale and then Harvard Law School. He was a poet, intellectually gifted, and uh, was recruited into the, uh, well, he joined the army initially uh, when the war started and then uh, became recruited by, he was a candidate for recruitment by the Office of Strategic Services and ended up in London, which is where he met Kim Philby. And in London, yeah. he was working um, on Italian matters. He was looking at the situation in Italy after the invasion of Italy by the Allies through uh, Sicily and then into mainland Italy. And he was he was charged with uh, overseeing a lot of operations against the Italian Communist Party. So he was actually running against the, if you like, the Communists and, and therefore indirectly the Soviet Union. So he built this relationship with Ilby because... The office in London wanted him to have a strong connection with MI6, and Philby was made his point of contact, and that was the way in which they built a personal relationship and spent a lot of time together in London. And then later on, of course, when Philby was sent to Washington, D.C. as the key lead in the British Embassy here in Washington, D.C. as the MI6 liaison primarily with the Central Intelligence Agency, you know, they, they continued that very, very strong personal relationship. Until uh, you know, Philby became a subject of concern in Britain, and even after his, you know, he was he was marginalised and then exonerated, and then uh, basically brought back into service by MI6 and buried through various ways and means as a you know in his traditional journalistic roles, you know, in the Middle East where Philby continued Philby continued to have a relationship with Angleton, who had very strong relationships with the uh, Israeli Mossad. And, uh, I was quite interested in that initial meeting between sort of Angleton and Philby in this sort of tea shop. I think it's the Twinings tea shop, isn't it? And I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about that sort of first meeting, the sort of meeting of minds. There was this personal connectivity between someone who was very much an Anglophile, as Angleton was, and, and someone he admired, uh, who was this fairly upper class MI6 person who ostensibly had all the virtues of being, you know, a good British spy and knew a lot of things. And so there was a, this connectivity that was built on also a strong personal relationship. They obviously liked each other. Now, evidence of a homosexual relationship is is extremely scant. So one doesn't want to make uh, claims there, which may not be true. But it was clear that they had a very personal, very strong personal link. It was observed by, you know, a lot of people, often in retrospect, about their relationship. So they built they built a friendship, and as a result of that friendship, they would um, have meetings constantly, particularly when uh, Philby was here in Washington, totally off the record, privately, mainly in restaurants, cafes, and so forth, where they would exchange changed very sensitive information. That's pretty well documented and well known, but um, was really against all the typical rules that have existed since the time that uh, Philby was exposed and all of his friends. So when the British started to bring in the system that I was subjected to, which was called positive vetting, PVing, where we were all very, very closely looked into to make sure we were absolutely rock solid in terms of security, loyalty, and also uh, emotional and stability and being psychologically suited to the intelligence community, which clearly Philby was a, um, a, an extraordinarily weak link when he was recruited by Stuart Menzies, the head of 
MI6 on Burgess's recommendation. And, um, you know, in that initial meeting, it seemed quite clear that Philby, he was sort of sounding Angleton out. I think what he did was was subtle. He realised that Angleton was not, you know, a Marxist-Leninist, mm. uh, not prone probably towards the Soviet view, but with the uh, world economy and all of that. But he had vulnerabilities in terms of exchanging information unofficially because of this strong old boy network feeling about um, Philby and the British and he was a great admirer of the British during World War II. He, think, he thought, you know, Bletchley Park did incredible things, the double cross system, the way in which the British shared with OSS all of their good things and so on and so forth. And, and you know, the help that um, OSS had got from uh, Room 39, from Admiral Godfrey's football organization and people like Ian Fleming and SOE, Special Operations Executives. So there was this feeling of great loyalty. And so he believed in Philby and therefore began to share with Philby things that really she, he should never have shared and also done it more officially in secure places and also uh, with the full knowledge of uh, uh, his leadership. Then, of course, when he became director of counterintelligence, you know, for the hugely long period is when he showed his, if you like, the instability for which he uh, became well known later on and led to his dismissal from the Central Intelligence Agency, where he became a mole hunter, a scare hunter, wrecked a lot of careers, um, made all sorts of false claims about various British leaders and Australian leaders and people in the Five Eyes community, which raised, you know, in retrospect, raised doubts about his loyalty, whether he was doing this because he was a paid operative of the KGB. But there is no evidence to support the latter at all, none whatsoever. So there was a certain amount of psychological imbalance in the Angleton makeup. Yeah, yeah. No, I find him quite an interesting character because you mentioned in the book he was a sort of heavy drinker, and you describe these uh, so these meetings where they were exchanging information were happening in high class of restaurants and bars in Washington D.C. over martinis and over long lunches. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of those meetings? Those meetings where they they would share you know sensitive intelligence information, which was. Frankly, I mean, nowadays would be dismissal if someone like me had a private meeting in a bar in Washington and started to talk what we regard as TSSCI material, which is top secret special compartmented information material, which is code word material. I mean, just to go back historically, uh, you know, the Enigma material, that was all what we would call today TSSCI. I mean, talking about Enigma in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., it would be the end of your career. So they did that on a regular basis. We know that. And um, information was passed to and flow on the material, obviously, that Angleton passed to Philby would go back to the KGB. So he was basically handing it off to the Soviet Union. Well, the other side was obviously that Philby would, would dangle uh, carrots in front of Angleton and give him material that he would find useful as well. For, for example, some of the nuclear secrets, which Philby had access to because of the way in which uh, material was transferred through the British Embassy back to the UK. It was all done through guess whose machine in the Washington Embassy it was Kim Philby's machine, so he saw everything. So, in order to dangle things in front of, and um, this is an example of many, many, many things, but this is an example of where Philby would, if you like, give him material, give him information, which he'd already passed to the Russians. And so, for example, Angleton, who was very close to the Israelis and the Mossad, you know, could dangle, um, frankly, nuclear secrets in front of the Israelis, who subsequently did build themselves a nuclear weapon. So all of that sort of thing went on on a regular basis. When the situation over McLean became clear because of the uh, Venona project and all of the good things the Australian Secret Intelligence Service did, I mean, that was the worst thing that Angleton could ever have done because he essentially tipped off Kim Philby to tip off Guy Burgess. Yeah, and Guy Burgess was staying with Philby, wasn't he, at the time when this happened? Yeah, and that raised, uh, you know, that raised doubts about that relationship, which obviously went back to Trinity College, Cambridge, where they were students together. Philby had recruited Burgess, and Burgess recruited Philby into MI6 through Stuart Menzies, the director of SIS. And so the... Suspicions there of of a not just an ideological relationship, but also of an emotional relationship, are also I think relevant, but not proven. Although it was pretty well known that Burgess was a homosexual, and certainly you know Philby's sexual orientation 
it's never been proven either way. So I, I, I'm, I'm a person that would, would never ever raise that as a hard and fast uh, fact because I don't, I, I don't think there's any evidence to support it. But they did live together in a in a marital home where, you know, Philby's relationship with his various spouses was always what I would call equivocal. Let's put it that way. I think sort of Philby's sort of uh, traditionally seen as a womanizer, but uh, I don't know how true that is. But uh, certainly, the popular view of him is there. Yeah, that that's that's yeah, that's exactly right. And so, you know, raising these other issues are, I think, totally speculative and are not worth indulging in without hard facts. So, I, I have, in my book, I try to avoid anything that would be anything that was just over speculative and and, and raised doubts because that's not professional. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. So, um, with Guy Burgess fleeing to Moscow with Kim Philby's help, just as that was happening, Angleton calls Philby into the CIA headquarters for a meeting. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that meeting? Yeah, I mean, this is where the personal relationship and trust, in, in a sense, bore fruit for Philby because Angleton still continued to think that Philby was, you know, numero uno mm. in terms of loyalty and intelligence expertise and all the things he'd done during World War II when he was head of the Iberian section, where he wasn't particularly affected, by the way. I mean, I, have, I know a lot about what he did and what he didn't do. <laughs> and um, other parts of the community, like Bletchley Park and Room 39, you know, really kept him out of most things, thank goodness. So he wasn't able to mess with uh, uh, British operations in in Portugal, which I, I'm pretty familiar with. So I think when he went to Langley and basically is given the word that the Venona project and the Australian SIS, very clever operations against the KGB, where the, he had broken into various KGB operations, and Venona was reading essentially the KGB message traffic, you know, it became very obvious to um, the CIA leadership that were bad apples inside the British Secret Intelligence Service. And I think that was when Angleton made his biggest, biggest horrible mistake because he, he tipped off Philby that McLean was a bad apple. And remember, McLean was in a very significant position in the JIC, the Joint Intelligence Committee in London, where he saw just about everything that was worth anything that came in through the various sources and methods of British intelligence, which was GCHQ Cheltenham, the success of the Bletchley Park in World War II, uh, MI5 and MI6, and the and the defense, the various defense intelligence organizations, such as the Directorate of Naval Intelligence, which was hugely, hugely important, is really the you know, origins of British intelligence all came out of the Navy from the original Office of Naval Intelligence, not Office of Naval, the Naval Intelligence Division, and then Blinker Hall, and then Commander Mansfield Cumming forming MI6 after World War One, and then the transformation of the code-breaking organization to what became Bletchley Park, and then after World War II, uh, GCHQ Cheltenham. So there was a, you know, there was a, a terrible, terrible mistake by by Angleton based on this personal relationship and trust and, and unofficial exchanges that led him to basically give the game away to to Philby and making Philby realize that not only was McLean exposed, but there was obviously going to be danger that he be exposed of what you might call the third man, the third, the other two being Burgess and McLean. Well, Philby was the third man uh, and was, was later became investigated, but sadly, because of British incompetence in the counterintelligence world, uh, was exonerated, even in the House of Commons. And it wasn't until much later that the data really showed that it was, but only showed that Philby was it. And then the, the story about him escaping from Beirut is pretty well known now, and a certain amount of incompetence on the part of British counterintelligence, as well as MI6 itself. Well, let's, can we talk a bit about that? When Philby falls under suspicion... And obviously, we talk about the British counterintelligence incompetency. Why was it so incompetent? I think the reason was there was not a structure in place like the that became after all this these scandals where that I was subjected to, where the British counterintelligence organisation was ext became extremely mm. professional in looking both looking into people's backgrounds and then monitoring people during their careers, so that when they came up for regular review. It was subjected to, um, just as I was, to all manner of investigation. I mean, telephone tapping, mail, banking details, 
I mean, everything to do with your personal life. Uh, and, and so, you know, someone like Philby, obviously being paid by the KGB and all of his comings and goings would be very much easily exposed if um, they'd had a very good counterintelligence organization. So they didn't have any of that uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And it wasn't until after these scandals that, you know, the whole positive vetting process was brought into being. And the disconnect between MI5, if you like, as an overseer of MI6 became much more efficient and effective. And similarly with people being reviewed to work at uh, GCHQ Cheltenham or in the defense intelligence organizations like the you know, Director of Naval Intelligence, Air Force and Army Intelligence. So it was a very, very poor system of, of reviewing people with very much a old boy network, very much relying upon, you know, where you went to school, which college you went to, you know, you're a good chap because, you know, you went to Trinity yeah, yeah, College, yeah. Cambridge, and you came from a good family. It was in fact, you know, these guys were, were traitors. Mm, they played the system. So what happened to Philby and Angleton during this time that Philby was under suspicion? Did they stay in contact or, or, or was it sort of quiet between them? It, it, it never, I don't think it ever became quiet. And I think the issues leading up to the, uh, what became the Bay of Pigs scandal and then the Cuban Missile Crisis and then the assassination of President Kennedy, 1963, which is after Philby had defected in January 60. Remember, the president was assassinated in November, November 23rd, if I remember the correct date. There was there was this period when you know Philby, you know, went into obscurity but didn't and was brought back by MI6 and was working just as he always had done, under his cover of being, you know, a journalist and all of that. But he was still one of the boys. Mm. He was still an operative, um, as if really he was still as good as gold. And huge mistake. And there was no proper counterintelligence launched against him. So the connectivity with Angleton, who regarded Philby as being exonerated and, if you like, made clean by the British system when, you know, there was a statement in the House of Commons that Philby was not a British traitor. You know, he was good. I mean, I mean, that kind of publicity really reassured Angleton that Philby was as good as gold. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't until 63 that, you know, the truth came out. So when Philby was finally revealed and exposed to being a traitor, what happened to him and Angleton at this point? Well, don't forget that that period was a very sensitive period. There was the, the whole situation with Cuba and the Bay of Pigs, and there was undoubtedly uh, connectivity there. And of course, it was I show in the book how Angleton gave away the game to Philby about the Bay of Pigs operation. And of course, the Russians were told, the Soviet Union, and they, of course, tipped off uh, Fidel Castro. So that was, a, that was a huge, huge mistake, again, by Angleton. This is 61 now. Um, and then we go into 62, and we have the Cuban Missile Crisis, which creates in, here in the United States a big, huge political divide based on the lead up from the Bay of Pigs to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was handled extraordinarily well by President Kennedy. I mean, he did an incredible job. I mean, he did do a, a negotiation with Khrushchev over the uh, American missile sites in Turkey as a quid pro quo, but at the same time, he diffused what, what was looking at one stage like a horrific uh, strategic situation. Well, that, that was overcome. But what happened as a result of the failure of the Bay of Pigs, which is a CIA operation, which Angleton was extremely heavily involved with his boss, Richard Helms, who subsequently became director of the CIA, that created a complete disconnect between the, the top leadership, and particularly Angleton and Helms, and the White House, and specifically between the president and his brother, you know, Robert Kennedy, who was the attorney general of the United States. And they had they lost complete faith in the CIA after the Bay of Pigs. They made that very clear. And at the same time, Angleton and his boss were running uh, internal covert operations that were geared to destabilizing the uh, regime in Cuba, unknown to uh, President Kennedy and his brother. So we can talk more about that in due course. So that was all going on at the same time that Philby was in Beirut and maintaining contact with with uh, Angleton, because Angleton was always backwards and forwards into Israel, uh, strong relations with the Mossad, and blah, blah, blah. And, and as you know, there are, there, are, there are 
memoria to uh, Angleton in Israel to this day, commemorating his, if you like, loyalty and support to the Israeli Mossad. I mean, this was this was out of whack. I mean, this was this was not what he should have been doing. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So you know that was a, that was a very set, that was a very sensitive period when, you know, leading up to a crisis when, uh, in fact, if we can talk about it now, when Angleton and his boss were running inside the United States, not not untypical, by the way, although he was charged later on by him. I mean. Uh, the director himself, and became director, say he was subsequently prosecuted, federal court for various misdemeanors, not regarding this situation, but others, where he had lied as well to Congress and so on and so forth about what he'd been up to. They were using American citizens who were pro um, anti Castro, but basically pro, if you like, the more right wing view of uh, the Soviet Union and the relationships between the U.S. and Russia at a time when President Kennedy was trying to both stabilize relations with Castro and also with the Russians or the Soviet Union. And there was a complete disconnect uh, and disagreement, and uh, Helms's people were operating totally uh, without uh, presidential approval. And so all the relationships they built in the American Southwest, of which Lee Harvey and Oswald was part of that group, was clearly not appropriate. And I think that's what will subsequently come out when President Biden, I think later this year, hopefully releases some of the more highly classified documents to do with the assassination of President Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. So I want to make it clear, I don't, I don't see the CIA being directly involved. I'm not making that accusation. What I am saying is the people that they were using as anti-Castro operatives, which is not unusual to use American citizens. So. That wasn't in that, that sense of leave, because we do obviously use American citizens to, to do intelligence operations overseas, right? So that, that was not, if you like, illegal. But what was right on the edge was the fact that those same people were not only anti-Castro, anti guess what? They were hugely anti the Kennedys, hugely. That was the, the area where Helms and Angleton showed incredibly bad judgment in not understanding the nature of these people and how violently aggressive they were towards the, the Kennedy family and his policies, whether it was to do with Cuba or Russia or um, the Cold mm. War. And in a similar situation, you draw parallels in your book, actually, to 9-11 is a classic example of the CIA not sharing information with the FBI. Did Angleson, do you think, have intelligence that could have prevented the assassination of President John F. Kennedy? Undou undoubtedly, if you if you when you go through the book and you look at what went on in the um, you know in the Mexican embassy where we had an incredibly capable man Winston Scott who was the chief of station there who was tracking various things that were going on between out of Mexico out of Mexico City between there and um, the Russians and Fidel Castro's people. I explain all that in the book and what. It, Incredibly capable person he was, but he was later, you know, all his information was withheld. I mean, their, their family tried to get ex exposure of all that, but they didn't succeed. And Winston Scott was a very good, very fine officer, very good patriot, and and was trying to do things. And then he realized that there was obviously another agenda, and that agenda was clearly, um, if you like, running against the tide of the president's policies, you know, John F. Kennedy. And so if you if you look at all the things that went on between Winston Scott and Angleton, you'll see how manipulative Angleton was and his boss, and how they didn't take the necessary action with the FBI to keep them completely informed. Because if J. Edgar Hoover's people had been told about that group in the Southwest that they were using for these anti-Castro operations, but they were also violently anti the president. That the FBI would have inserted agents there, tracked them, tapped their phones, checked their mail, everything, and trailed them, and, and, and then would have figured out the role that just one person, namely Lee Harvey Oswald, played in that group, where there was clearly more than him. You know, the one chapter on I'm Just a Pantsy says it all. You know, he was only one of many people actually involved in an uh, anti Kennedy group that led to the assassination of the president in November 1963. So I think that was. That whole thing was just appalling on the part of the 
of Helms's people, and particularly Angleton, who deliberately withheld information from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, somewhat dissimilar to the 9-11 situation where the agency had information of uh, those people coming into the United States, and didn't pass it on to the FBI. If they'd known that, that certain people were here, you know, they were basically Saudis and uh, you know, the Egyptians, they would have they would have tracked them. They would have tracked them, monitored their phone calls, followed them to all that flight training they got up to and all of that, and then would have been able to prevent any kind of attempt on uh, the Twin Towers and, and the Pentagon. So, I, you know, that's, that's, you know, all those years later, the same thing occurred where there was not the right kind of connectivity between um, counterintelligence, which the FBI was responsible, a little bit like MI5's role, same role, not the role of the CIA. The CIA had its own internal counterintelligence for its own internal purposes, which is what Angleton did. But he exceeded all of those roles and got into all sorts of other things, which were well beyond his remit. As the head of counterintelligence, he sowed all these wrong seeds about various people, including you know, Britain's own prime minister. I mean, he tried to <laughs> he tried to make out that Harold Wilson was a Soviet agent. Try to make out the head of Britain's MI5 was a Soviet agent, made accusations against the Australians. Or, I mean, let alone his own internal people who were completely innocent um, bystanders who were very, very loyal and very capable CIA officers. So this was a very, 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 very sad and pretty appalling story of uh, the way Angleton conducted himself. It, it is, it is indeed. And actually, those accusations against Sir Roger Hollis, people still believe them. Who was that journalist in the UK who who wrote a book about him being the, you know, the sixth man or something? It's uh, Chapman Pincher. Chapman Pincher was the journalist. Do you remember him? Yeah, I do indeed. Um, there's no, I mean, um, to my very best knowledge, mm. and I'll always stand corrected on anything, to my very best knowledge, he was completely innocent. So, I mean, by him, I mean Sir Roger Hollis. Yeah, yeah. One last question connected to the Kennedy assassination. What was the deal with Lee Harvey Oswald? Was he knowingly working for any particular side, or was he just one of these people who managed to be a useful idiot and end up working for everybody? Or yeah, you know, was he working for the Russians? Was he working for the Cubans? Who was he working for, do you think? Well, there are lots of um, interesting theories and work being done on him by um, let me give you let me give you uh, one reference. There's one book by a man called Patrick Nolan. That's N O L A M, and it's called CIA Rogues and the Killing of the Kennedys. That, for example, brought out with very very strong evidence, by the way, extremely well researched evidence about various programs that Angleton ran under Helms, which was to do with the manipulation of several people, including Lee Harvey Oswald. And he's, you know, he's a Marine, he was a sharpshooter, a sniper, and all that, defected, learned Russian. So he spoke Russian. So, you know, what's that about? He defects the Soviet Union, hangs around there, then decides to come back, and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, people like Patrick Nolan and others have, have shown how there were various programs run by Angleton and his associates of the agency whereby they, they had them under various drug programs. Now, the truth of that, I think, has to be very closely examined. And I hope that the data that the president will release, I hope by the end of this year, will bring out what really went on in the various programs that Angleton and his boss controlled, that were to do with, if you like, the psychological control of people like Lee Harvey Oswald. Now that I think is, um, you know, is possibly a bridge too far, but on the other hand, the evidence that he and others have put forward is actually quite compelling, and so you have to say, well, um, there were others as well that were involved in the assassination plot. Uh, he was only one, um, but obviously, um, the Warren Commission obviously didn't get all of that right. I mean, they were actually deceived. I mean. Uh, people lied to the Warren Commission. Angleton committed perjury in front of the Warren Commission, as did his boss. Mm. And his boss was subsequently prosecuted and fined and given a suspended jail sentence. I mean, you think the director of the Central Intelligence Agency gets a suspended jail sentence? What does that tell you? So um, there's a lot yet to be exposed on that issue. And so I'm I'm personally waiting to see without me making any you know, any 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 strong commitments on data 
wait for the information to be released by the United States government, by actually the president of the United States. But it's very clear that the agencies, if you like, control and manipulation of people who are in the anti-Castro group that they were working, there's no question about that, were also anti-Kennedy. I don't think that was deliberate. I think it was coincidental, but clearly they should have recognized that they were dealing with some people who were unsavory and, and totally, totally a threat to the security of the president of the United States. And I think that was a huge, huge irresponsible misjudgment on the part of both Richard Helms and James Jesus Angleton and the people who work for them and control these various people in uh, the American Southwest. Yeah, indeed. Well, Anthony, I think you've covered most of my questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we sort of wrap up today? No, I think what this all shows is that the recruitment of people is so important and the background checks, loyalty checks on a regular basis is very important. So people like Haynes, who was a pretty bad uh, American spy, not as, quite as bad as Philby, but getting pretty close, um, you know, don't, and the FBI spy. I mean, that's one thing. That's, that's, that's to do with checking on people and verifying that they're loyal and reliable and, and stable as, as individual citizens and all of that, as well as being having the necessary capabilities to perform as uh, intelligence specialists. But at the same time, the community needs to have mechanisms whereby, you know, the information can be shared without necessarily giving away sources and methods. You know, it's like the situation in 9-11 where the CIA didn't have to tell the FBI exactly how it knew um, the sources and method used to detect and track the movement of the of what became the 9-11 terrorists into the United States. You don't need to do that, but you just say, hey, these people are here, and by the way, they're right there right now, and, and then start tracking them. And, you know, that's the and that's a kind of common sense view of the world. And I think the uh, reforms that were made uh, with the creation of the National Intelligence Directorate and all of that uh, was good, although the downside of it was that it you know, became extraordinarily large and bureaucratic <laughs> instead of, uh, you know, uh, much more a smaller organization, but very, very effective. And I think that's one, one comment that most people make about British intelligence is it's nowhere near as if you like, it's large, with perhaps the one exception of GCHQ Chalman, which is a pretty large organization by any standards, and it's global, whereas the, the rest of British intelligence is, is modest inside compared with, say, the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah, well, the information is useless if it just sits in a file, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, trust between the Five Eyes community, of which I've been a member for 50-plus years, is essential. You know, the exchanges of people, the relationships that you make, um, sharing intelligence, not necessarily sources and methods, if they're very, very sensitive and private and individual to each mm. country. You don't need to tell um, the Americans, don't need to tell the British how they you know, got one piece of information that is, came from a highly sensitive source. And some of the British or the Canadians, Australians, and New Zealanders. And people often say about the Kiwis, oh, they're just small, they don't do much. Well, they do, they do a lot. And they've got some extremely capable intelligence capabilities. Well, you know, the five eyes have, have, I think, evolved into a very well-organized and secure um, organization, but it still depends upon individuals being highly trustworthy, of high integrity, and so forth. And that needs good counterintelligence constantly. And if we're going to expand more intelligence sharing with the Japanese and the Indians, which we are doing through the Quad and now through um, particularly the Japanese desire to join the Five Eyes, well, you know, that's going to take another level of very, very good counterintelligence organization to make sure that if we start sharing more and more with the Japanese, um, that everything is secure. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, the more people who get access, the more you've got to be careful. But yes. Yeah, and only sharing that only sharing things that are relevant too, that, that are that are quick there are quid pro quos like the Japanese give us some very good intelligence. Well, we want to give them intelligence in return, but make sure it's just relevant for their needs and they don't need to have the whole of Pandora's box opened up for them when most a lot of it might not even be at all yes. relevant. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, um, well, thank you very much for your time today. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think it's just a great pleasure to be able to chat with you, Chris, as always. And uh, I hope people enjoy the book. Um, it's opened up a lot of 
uh, issues and mm. questions. There's, there's some very critical answers yet to be revealed, but I think it's what I try to do is to get each the reader to get into the facts as we know them today uh, in a you know in a novelistic format rather than some turgid study, and to um, and then wait for more documentation to be made available by the United States government about what, you know, specifically I'm talking now about 1963 and the lead up to the tragedy in Dealey Plaza in, in yeah. Dallas, Texas. Do we do we know when that release might be or is it just sort of end of the year but with no specific date? Well, the, the president, President Biden said that he hopes to release information about the 1963 assassination of President John F. Kennedy by the end of this year. Mm. Now, that remains to be seen. I mean, I'm not suggesting they're not going to do it, but I don't know is yeah, the answer. No, fair okay. enough. I don't know. Fair enough. Well, we'll have to keep an eye out and potentially have you back on when we do find out more information. Yeah, but I think I think what I presented in you know in the book in Crossroads in Time, you know, Phil Ben Angleton and the study of treachery is mm. is presenting all the evidence that is 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 relevant and accurate without any kind of exaggeration and speculation that, you know, with Fortz, there's no real hardcore evidence. And, and certainly this is why I, I was very loath to get into the issues that were raised by, say, Patrick Nolan and in that book about uh, the killing of the Kennedys by the CIA. I mean, CIA rogues. I mean, I thought that was extremely, a little bit over the top. Without, it was the well documented, it began to raise doubts about. Things that haven't been made public knowledge. So, if it turns out that all of that was true, well, you know, God bless Patrick Nolan. But right now, we need to see a real hardcore government documentation. Mm. Well, Andy, where can listeners find out more about you and your book? I think online. I think, as far as I know, Crossroads in Time, you can buy it through Amazon. Uh, there's information there about me. I've written several books, as you know. And, uh, there's a lot of information about me. I'm not a. I'm not a secret. I'm pretty well known in the community. The Japanese, for example, have recently uh, bought into my book about the Five Eyes community. Between Five Eyes, the you know, 50 years of intelligence sharing, they they're actually you know, they're translating it into Japanese and publishing in Japan to expand public and professional knowledge of the Five Eyes community, which the Japanese are extremely keen to join. So, in order to do that. You've got to be educated. You've got to know the history and what's gone on over the years since Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, you know, committed to sharing intelligence in August 1940 on board HMS Prince of Wales in uh, Placentia Bay off of Newfoundland. And that's when it officially started, in my opinion. So it's a long history. Excellent. Well, well, thank you very much for your time today. Well, it's a great pleasure, Chris, always. This is Secrets and Spies. 